Yeah, it's amazing today how we sort of eat, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours of the day now, people getting up yes. early for work, they're, you know, we're snacking late, late at night on the couch, so all of a sudden these eating windows have just expanded and almost flipped themselves on their head. Um, you talk a lot about, you know, the work of Walter Longo and Sachin Panda on yep. time-restricted uh, feeding in, in, your, in your book. Can you walk listeners through a little bit of, of how you started perhaps using that and how you might use that with your patients? Yeah, I think you, you hit on it when you said that people are grazing, you know. They get up early. Listen, we're a working culture, right? We get up early, we go to bed late, you know, that those are that's what we do. But the problem is that we kind of, as a culture, moved into a period where we're just eating that whole time, you know. So you're constantly getting. So what does that do to you? First of all, it increases your caloric uh, intake. It, it can't help but do that. You're just constantly eating, thinking that you're keeping a blood sugars level and you're keeping this, when in fact that's not what's happening at all. They're spiking all over the place. But Walter Longo is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scientist. He's done some amazing work looking at, starting with population studies and tribesmen, looking to see how, the, how they uh, eat and how they uh, metabolize uh, food and how they function. And what we see when you take it to the next level is that if you start to narrow that window down, it does two very powerful things for you. So if you you, you do time-restricted feeding, right, that means rather than eating all day, like say you get up at 6 a.m. and you go to bed at 10 p.m., right? So rather than being up for those 16 hours eating, you say, okay, I can get up, but maybe I don't eat right away. Or I get up and I eat, but I stop early. So your window narrows. And as you win the narrow, the window narrows from 12, say from 16 to 14 to 12 to 10, good things happen, right? The biggest problem from people that I find that when they try to do fasting, and there's a lot of fasting fads and different versions of this, whether it's two days on, five days or whatever, which way you want to try to fast, it's always disabled by what? By hunger. You get hungry. It's really hard to fast. I don't think anyone can do it. It's really, really, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline. It's much less, much less is required if you just narrow the, the, the time at which, during which you eat. I had actually, it's funny because I tried to, I gave a talk about time restricted feeding and I had this lovely woman come up to me after the, the talk and she said, Dr. Monto, so um, I wanted to ask you about about uh, about fasting, he said. Like, how fast do I have to eat? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> it's not, so it, it seems like a simple concept, but maybe it's not. So, what you do is maybe you don't eat right away if that works for you. But if you're hungry, sure you can eat. But the idea is to take maybe the, even the same calories that you normally eat, but to uh, narrow them in time. So we learned a lot from studies on Muslim athletes during Ramadan, you know, because Ramadan now is, uh, you know, the Olympics will fall during Ramadan, mm -hmm. World Cup falls during Ramadan, as it did in Brazil a few years ago. And you can see that the athlete's performance actually improves a little bit, not declines a little bit. And part of that is, uh, I think, driven by these spikes in, in energy levels that you get with fasting, because the body figures, this dude is never going to feed me, right? So I need to get energy released so I can go find some food. So in a way, you're leveraging your circadian rhythms, you're leveraging your metabolism to help you. So I, I think it's, uh, again, by restricting calories without really suffering the, the problems that you get with being hungry, that you can narrow that down a little bit. A very successful, very powerful way that you can get the benefits of fasting without really going full on. Yeah, it's definitely... Uh pretty handy for folks who can sort of just have a coffee in the morning, delay that breakfast, maybe early lunch, and then yeah, all of a sudden it, the window shrinks pretty pretty quickly. And Yeah, and I'm not saying like breakfast is not important. I think it's just a lot of this turns out to be just, you know, what you define as breakfast, right? I mean, what you're defining as the break in your fasting, right? And how you do that, really, it's going to vary a lot from individual. But the same thing I, I was talking about with diet. There's a lot of ways to be healthy and eat healthy that can be tailored and personalized to each individual based on their taste, based on their, their, um, their social background, cultural backgrounds that works. 
Yeah, and I guess that's one of the sort of problems we have in the in the culture today, I guess, is the fact that we sort of like to stay out a bit later or work goes later, so people are eating a bit later in the evening. Maybe it's yeah, the, the, sure. the Netflix effect. I don't know if everybody's on the couch yeah. watching Game of Thrones. And well, that. it's also people work at night. You know, they work these late shifts. I mean, I, you know, as, a, as I work in the healthcare sector and, you know, you have nurses that pull these late shifts and they come home. So wh- when does the day start and end? It, it blurs. I mean, that creates problems because it messes people up in their own sleep cycles. And you've talked about it in your podcast many times, different ways to kind of combat that. But I think uh, when you're talking about um, trying to use fasting in a very friendly way, I think that's not bad to just try to cut your meals down so you're eating everything within 12 hours. If you, if your listeners try it, I think it's it's amazing how powerful a technique that is. It can really help you. And when you get really good at it, you can probably get to about 10 hours very comfortably and it cuts your calorie down so that it kind of fits life. People feel better when they do that. They really do. Absolutely. And, you know, you bring in the what we, I brought in the discussion around coffee, and, and you, of course, touched on coffee in your book as well in relation to longevity, health span. Could you talk to folks a little bit about some of the benefits yeah, of coffee? Wow. Potentially, thank, to- thank God coffee came out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was, everyone was sweating <laughs> oh on that one. Oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. I think I was sweating bullets as I, as I did because I pulled. I mean, you got to like the work behind the book. I mean, I probably pulled about 3,000 studies, of which 1,000 – just were worthless uh, about different things. And coffee was one of the very uh, important uh, things I needed to jury for people. You know, I needed to let people know, is this in or is this out? But I think um, it, during the writing of the book, and even now, because there's some big recent studies in the UK published about the, the benefits of coffee. And I wish I could tell your listeners why it works, but I don't really know. And I don't think we really know. So there's so many chemicals, uh, whether it's chlorogenic acid or other things in coffee, but whatever it is, it does seem to have an effect. And I don't think it's driven by the caffeine. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter. It's whatever is in the coffee, but yep, this, this month it's in. So, uh, we did find that, uh, that, um, amongst all studies, I didn't find a single study, uh, that found uh, a negative effect. And I found some fairly positive studies and some of the big studies out of Harvard and some other very good uh, public uh, health studies on it. Yeah, it's amazing how, um, you know, the recent work that came out around Alzheimer's and dementia and how you mentioned yeah, even the decaffeinated form of coffee was benefiting folks just as well as the caffeinated form. So obviously more going on with all those polyphenols, chlorogenic acid, as you mentioned, that are really absolutely helping absolutely. people out. Obviously tastes really good. So that's a nice, uh, nice added benefit. Um, yeah, I think, you know, what was interesting too, even though tea is not consumed in the same amounts, there seems to be also some effects, although not as strong in the population studies that I looked at. So yeah, it's, Teas, yeah, green tea, black tea. It's amazing how people do get most of their uh, polyphenols from tea or coffee. So for folks who don't drink it, yeah, I think that's probably the key is in the polyphenols. And we, I don't think we really understand this complex interaction between our metabolism and that. And I'm sure there's some stimulant effects, but I think, uh, you know, um, as we try to pick out the ways to not just live longer but to live better. Yeah, if you if you're into coffee, that's a good thing. Don't stop. <laughs> right? For sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Good for the brain. Good for yeah, diabetes yeah. prevention. Everything. So, Doc, I deal a lot in men's yeah. health, and I'm sure yes. this is something that's come up. You know, we talk sort of prescriptions for longevity. I think a lot yes. of men think that you know, if a quick testosterone prescription will be the ticket to more muscle, better libido, thinner waistline. Yeah, I wish that were the case, but can, um, can you, you know, walk yeah. us through? Yeah, what you found well, in you your know, uh, work? yeah, I, I think what I found actually was it's interesting because about eighty five percent of the prescriptions for testosterone that are written in the U.S. are for people with normal levels of testosterone. You know, it's uh, it's and there's no absolutely no nothing to show in the research that having more vitamin T is going to do it for you. Uh, either have you live longer or have better time in the boudoir. So, um, you know, I think it's one of those things. Listen, if you if you're a man like me, I'm 58 now. Um, if you're getting into your late 50s, you feel you know you're you're feeling like your energy is sapped and you get a blood test that shows that your free testosterone is low, 
maybe it might be worth with a doctor's guidance to try that. But you got to be super careful with that stuff. You know, anytime we're into the hormones, we also have inadvertent results. I mean, um, prostate cancer, other things that can affect men's health in a very negative way, in a very sneaky, slow way, you have to be careful with. Listen, if you work out, you're going to get a little bump in your testosterone level. It won't last long, but it'll give you that little boost you need. And I think for most men, their testosterone levels are probably just fine. Yeah, it's interesting how you know a lot of guys, obviously, typically with some weight to lose, probably not sleeping as much at night, maybe drinking too much alcohol, all these kind of things. That's so uh, many low things. hanging fruit that tends to get ignored and kind yeah. of look for that quick fix, right? Yeah, and then you have all the medications that guys get on. I mean, if we could get away from some of the medications, and again, this is you know a failing of the medical profession in general. You know, it's so easy to just write a prescription. You know, whether it's for depression or for high blood pressure or for a diabetes, you know what? You should write a prescription for exercise. You know, and go work out. And I think uh, we'd be doing our patients and ourselves a lot better service.